Hey folks, this is KJ from the Scariest Movie Ever channel on YouTube. And I have a video here that to me is very important, and it covers a subject I've covered in other videos as well. And that's the deception of Freemasonry, what Freemasonry really is. Now, I get attacked consistently on my videos about Freemasons from people that say they're Freemasons. I wanted to make this video and just show you this, and that way we can just end the discussion. because this book right here did it for me. It's called The Deadly Deception. Uh, somebody suggested this to me like three years ago. It was a friend of mine. It's from Jim Shaw. And this guy was an actual 33rd degree Mason. He made it all the way through. I'm just reading a few of the pages. And I'm going to let you see from his own words what happened. Kind of the way that he first realized he was about to become the 33rd. And then all the way kind of through the process and what happened. So there's just a few things you need to know going into this is that uh, throughout this whole thing he was never really a Christian uh, until later on. He had been going to a doctor for a long time while he was rising up to the ranks of masonry and the doctor was always kind of talking to him about Jesus and things like this. So the doctor, that all plays in later, but the doctor was trying to lead him on the right path, right? Get this out to your friends and family that are Masons or that are thinking of being Masons. Uh, this book can really save some people and I think this this video could really help some people as well. It's my belief that anybody that reads this book or for that matter even listens to this portion of the book and watches this video. If you watch this and you still think it's okay to be a Christian and a Mason, you weren't paying attention. A few things to consider would be, I mean, for one, to be inducted into the Shriners, a candidate must acknowledge that Muhammad is the true prophet, and their fez is symbolic of a, quote, great victory for Islam, uh, when in 1465 the residents of Fez killed thousands of Jews, reportedly leaving like less than a dozen alive. So the folks riding around in Fez hats and circles in those little cars don't seem so cute anymore, do they? In highly disciplined lodges, the name of Christ is rarely, if ever, spoken, and in in general, the Bible, the Quran, uh, Buddhism, and other sacred texts are all placed at equal weight. So this should also be a problem for Christians who take scripture seriously and understand that Muhammad states in the Quran that the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen. So either Muhammad or Jesus is mistaken. Now this book also documents really well the peer pressure that plays a role in moving a Christian to make blood and death oaths that are also clearly forbidden in the Bible. So with that being said, let's get started. Easter was approaching, and one quiet morning I was at home recuperating from the second operation when the doorbell rang. It was a special delivery letter from the Supreme Council in Washington, notifying me that I had been selected for the 33rd degree. I could hardly believe it was true. This honor is one most Masons never even think of receiving. It was too much, too far out of reach, beyond limits of reality. It was unreal to think I had actually been selected. It was an honor just to be considered for this ultimate degree, and I had actually been selected, chosen by that small and powerful group, the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree. I called Bonnie to share the good news with her. In talking with her, I surprised myself by asking her if she thought I should accept it. What a strange thing to ask, I thought, but before I could contemplate it, she said, Why, sure, why wouldn't you accept it? You've worked so hard for it. It's taken you so long to get there, by all means, you should accept it. So I returned my acceptance immediately and began making plans for the trip. Some of the world's most prominent and influential men in the world would undoubtedly be there to participate when I was given this ultimate degree. For me, little Jimmy Shaw, who had gone to work at age 5 and made it alone since age 13. They would be there to give the 33rd degree to me. It was really a bit difficult to take it all in. In order to receive the 33rd degree, it was necessary to go to Washington, D.C. The initiation and related functions were to last three days. Since Bonnie could participate in practically none of these things I would be doing each day, she decided not to go along. We were both excited as I made preparations to leave. 
but I was not as excited as I expected to be. The edge was taken off the excitement because inside me it was mixed with a considerable amount of conviction. Way down deep there was a growing restlessness, an increasing conflict, produced by the things the doctor had been sharing and by all the scripture I had been reading. Preparing to receive this ultimate honor was not as thrilling as it might otherwise have been. I flew into Washington National Airport and took a taxi to the house of the temple on Northwest 16th Street. Upon arriving at the temple, I was met by a receptionist who asked if I were there to receive the 33rd degree. I was surprised to find a woman in those sacred Masonic precincts, but said that I was and showed her my letter from the Supreme Council. She then told me that in order to receive the degree, I would be expected to make a, quote, minimum donation of a very large amount of money. At least it was a really large amount for me. So this took me completely by surprise, for there had been not a word about any such minimum donation in the letters sent me by the Supreme Council. I didn't carry that much money with me and had left my checkbook at home. But I was able to borrow some of the money from one of the other men, and I gave it to her. We candidates were all unhappy about this unpleasant surprise and grumbled to one another about it, but were not unhappy enough to forsake the degree over it. We were too close to the top of the mountain to turn back at this point. The house of the temple is quite impressive, a bit awesome really, standing large, gray, and silent on the east side of Northwest 16th Street between R and S streets. It looms very wide and tall from the curb. There is a huge expanse of granite pavement in front of it, including three levels of narrowing steps as the entrance is approached. Flanking the entrance are two sphinx-like granite lions with women's heads, the neck of one entwined by a cobra and decorated with the onk. Adorning the neck and breast of the other is an image of a woman, symbolic of fertility and procreation. In the pavement, just in front of the tall bronze doors, are two Egyptian swords with curved serpentine blades, and between the swords, brass letters set in stone saying, The Temple of the Supreme Council of the 33rd and Last Degree of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. Over the tall bronze doors, cut into the stone, is the statement, Freemasonry builds its temples in the hearts of men and among nations. High above the entrance, partially concealed by stone columns, is an elaborate image of the Egyptian sun god, backed with radiating sun and flanked by six large golden snakes. Inside is elegance. Polished marble, exotic wood, gold and statuary, there are offices, a library, dining room, kitchen, council room, temple room, and a large meeting room. This room is like a luxurious theater, rather elegantly furnished and decorated. The ceiling is dark blue with lights set into it and give the appearance of stars. These lights can even be made to twinkle like stars in the sky. There's a stage well equipped and it's very nicely done, but the thing that is most noticeable is the way the walls are decorated with serpents. There are all kinds of serpents, some very long, some very large, some very small. Many of the Scottish Rite degrees include the representation of serpents, and I recognized them among those decorating the walls. It was almost impressive and gave me a strange mixture of the sensations of being in a temple and in a tomb. Something sacred, but something threatening. I saw busts of outstanding men of the Rite, including two of Albert Pike, who were buried in the wall. The first day was devoted to registration, briefings, and interviews. We were called into one of the offices, one at a time, and interviewed by three members of the Supreme Council. When my turn came, I was ushered into the office and seated. The very first question I was asked was, Of what religion are you? Not long before this, I would have answered with something like, I believe the ancient mysteries, the old religion, and I believe in reincarnation. However, without thinking at all about how to answer, I found myself saying, I'm a Christian. Then, to my surprise and theirs, I asked them, Are you men born again? The man in charge quickly stopped me by saying, We're not here to talk about that. We're here to ask you questions. After they sent me back out, I sat down and thought about it. When the next man came out, I asked him, Did they ask you if you were a Christian? And he said, Yes, they did. Well, what did you tell them? I asked. And he replied, I told them, Hell no, and I never intend to be. 
Then he said a strange thing to me. He said, you know, they said I'm going higher. And he left through a different door, looking pleased. The second day was the day of the actual initiation, held in the theater-like meeting room. Those of us who were receiving the degree were seated, and the ceremony was exemplified, or acted out in full costume, right before us, in the same way that we had performed the lesser degrees of the Scottish Rite all those years before. The parts in the exemplification were played by men of the 33rd degree. The representative candidate was dressed in black trousers, barefooted, bareheaded, and draped in a long black robe that reminded me of a very long black raincoat. He had a black cable toe around his neck, but was not hoodwinked. During the initiation, he was led around the stage, conducted by two men with swords, as the degree was performed for us. Instructions and signs were given. Upon the altar were four holy books, the Bible, the Quran, the Book of the Law, and the Hindu scriptures. At one point, the candidate was told to kiss the book, in quotes, of your religion, and representing us all, he leaned forward and did so. I remembered the first degree initiation when I was told to kiss the Bible, and at that moment something came full cycle. It was the final such kiss to be a part of my life. When it was time for the final obligation, we all stood and repeated the oath with the representative candidate, administered by the Sovereign Grand Inspector General. We then swore true allegiance to the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree, above all other allegiances, and swore never to recognize any other brother as being a member of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, unless he also recognizes the supreme authority of this Supreme Council. One of the conductors then handed the candidate a human skull upside down with wine inside of it. May this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me, as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. He then drank the wine. A skeleton, one of the brothers dressed like one, he looked very convincing, then stepped out of the shadows and threw his arms around the candidate. Then he and we continued the sealing of the obligation by saying, And may these cold arms forever encircle me, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. The Sovereign Grand Commander closed the meeting of the Supreme Council with the mystic numbers, striking with his sword five, three, one, and then two times. After the closing prayer we all said, Amen, 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 and it was over. There were some extremely prominent men there that day, including a Scandinavian king, two former presidents of the United States, an internationally prominent evangelist, two other internationally prominent clergymen, and a very high official of the federal government, the one who actually presented me with the 33rd degree certificate. Some made only brief appearances, others stayed much longer. However, they didn't do much mixing or socializing with us, except for those whom they'd already known. Even though these celebrities weren't extremely brotherly, it was still quite an experience for me just to be associated with them. It was easily the largest gathering of such prominent and influential men of which I have ever been a part of. The third day there was a banquet to celebrate our becoming Grand Inspector's General 33rd Degree. The banquet was a little anticlimactic, at least for me, and I was anxious to get it over with so I could return home. It was good to be a 33rd at last but it wasn't as exciting or fulfilling as I had thought it would be during all those years in the craft. I guess this was because of the profound changes going on deep within me. I'd returned home as soon as the 33rd degree award and related social functions were finished, for it was time for my next appointment with the doctor. After he had examined my eyes, he said they were healing fine, that he had felt good about the way they were looking, and as usual he spoke with me about the Lord. I told him that I had planned to come to his church the next Sunday and that I had been reading my Bible. Obviously pleased, he said, Good, keep studying, and your sight will soon be much better. By this time I knew what he meant. He was speaking of my spiritual sight. In the Scottish Rite, the Thursday before Easter is called Maundy Thursday, and it's a very important day. On this day we always performed a special service of communion in the local Scottish Rite temple. At this time I was wise master in the chapter of Rose Craw, and it was my job to preside over the exemplification of the ceremony. I had done this many times, and was known for my knowledge of the service and for doing a good job. 
On Thursday evening we gathered at our home temple and dressed for the ceremony. It was always a most solemn occasion and seemed a little awesome at the same time, even to those of us who had done it so many times before. We were dressed in long, black, hooded robes. We marched in, single file, with only our faces partly showing, and we took our seats. There was something very tomb-like about the setting. The silence was broken only by an organ, playing mournfully in the background, and there was no light except for the little bit that came through the windows. After the opening prayer, from which the name of Jesus Christ was conspicuously excluded, I stood and I opened the service. As I had done so many times before, I said, we meet this day to commemorate the death of our most wise and perfect master, not as inspired or divine, for this is not for us to decide, but as at least the greatest of the apostles of mankind. As I spoke these words that I had spoken so many times before, I had a strange and powerful experience. It was as if I were standing apart, listening to myself as I spoke, and the words echoed deep within me, shouting their significance. They were the same words I had spoken so many times before, but had meaning for me now. They made me sick, literally ill, and I stopped. The realization of what I had just said grew within me like the rising of a crescendo. I had just called Jesus an apostle of mankind who was neither inspired nor divine. There was a silent pause that seemed to last a very long time as I struggled with a sick, smothering within. When I was fully able, I continued with the service, and we gathered around a large table across the room in marching order. Once we were assembled at the table, I elevated the plate of bread, and I took a piece. I put my hand on the shoulder of the man in front of me, gave him the plate, and said, Take, eat, and give to the hungry. This continued until all had partaken of the bread. Then I lifted up the goblet of wine, took a sip, and said, Take, drink, and give to the thirsty. Again, this continued until all had partaken. Then I took the bread, walked over to the first row of spectators, and served it to the man previously chosen for the honor of representing the rest of the lodge. As I handed it to him, again I said, Take, eat, and give to the hungry. In like manner, I served the wine to him, saying, Take drink, and give to the thirsty. And he sat down. After this, we took our places at the table, shaped like a cross, and sat down. The setting was dark. Our long, sweeping robes were solid black, our faces neatly concealed in the hoods, and the mood was one of very heavy gloom. The Christless prayers and the hymns we sang fit right in. The one word that would describe the entire event to me would be black. It was indeed a black communion. It felt like a large, strange black mass. There was a large menorah in the center of the room with seven candles now burning. Standing again, I said, This is indeed a sad day, for we have lost our master. We may never see him again. He is dead. Mourn, weep, and cry, for he is gone. Then I asked the officers to extinguish the candles in the large menorah. One by one they rose, they walked to the center of the room, and extinguished the candle, leaving the room right after. Finally, with only the center candle still remaining, I arose, walked sadly to the menorah, and extinguished the last candle, the candle representing the life of Jesus, our most wise and perfect master. We had dramatized and commemorated the snuffing out of the life of Jesus, without once mentioning his name and the scene ended with the room in deep, dark silence. I walked out of the room, leaving only the darkness and the stillness of death. Once again, the single word best to describe it would be black. All through the service I was shaking and sick. I have never felt so sad. I had stumbled over the words, but somehow I made it to the completion of the ceremony and went back to the dressing room. I still didn't know much about praying, but felt that I had been sustained by the Lord through it all. Back in the dressing room, we hung up our black hooded robes, put our street clothes back on, and prepared to leave. Less than two hours had passed since I had arrived, but what had happened in that period of time had changed my life forever. Still sick in my heart, I changed clothes without a word to anyone. The others asked me what was wrong. I couldn't reply. They reminded me of that I had acted as wise master so many times before, that I was known for my smooth performance, and they asked what had gone wrong. I was choking on the awful reality of what we had said and done, the way we had blasphemed the Lord and the evil black mockery we had made of his pure and selfless death. With weeping welling up within me, I could only shake my head in silence and walk out. Mike was waiting for me at the door, expecting to get a ride home, and he asked, What's the matter, Jim? Are you sick? Finally able to speak, I quietly replied, No, Mike. I'm just sick of this. I'm just sick of all this.
I started down the wide steps in front of the large Scottish Rite temple. The realization and conviction was growing within me. I reached the bottom step and I stopped. Turning around, I looked back at the huge granite building and slowly studied the words. Carved in the stone across the top of the entrance, it said, Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite to Freemasonry. Something came clearly into focus in my understanding and I made a decision. This crisis point in my life, one which had required so many years for me to reach, passed in seconds. The truth was revealed and the choice was made, a choice that would be the difference between darkness and light, death and life, one that would last for eternity. Looking up at those words I had walked under so many times, words of which I had been so proud, I spoke to myself out loud. It was as if I were the only man in the world, as I heard myself say, slowly and deliberately, it isn't ancient, it isn't Scottish, it isn't free, and it isn't right. I turned away and I walked into the parking lot, knowing that I would never return. As I walked into the deepening darkness of that springtime night, I was walking into the growing light of the living God. As the natural darkness closed around me, the supernatural light welled up within me. With every step I took, as the temple receded behind me, I was more free. I will never return. The decision was made on that day. The die was cast. From that night onward, I would serve the true and living God, not the great architect of the universe. I would exalt and learn of him, not of Cyrus, Krishna, or Demeter. I would seek and follow Jesus, not the will of the wisp of the hidden wisdoms. And here's a personal message from the author just pertaining to what we just read. It says that as the story is closed, I would be greatly remiss if I did not make it clear that in my pre-Christian life I truly loved Freemasonry. I loved the men with whom I was associated in the lodge and the men with whom I worked so hard in the degrees and bodies of the Scottish Rite. Most of all, I was so very sure that I was doing what was right and pleasing in the sight of the great architect of the universe. Never in all my years of dedicated service to Masonry did anyone in the Lodge witness to me about the love and saving grace of Jesus. The Lodge attended a church once each year as a group. Each time the pastor, who was himself a Mason, would introduce us to the congregation and then exalt the craft, telling them about all our wonderful works. We usually left the church thinking of how wonderful we were and feeling sorry for all those in the church who were not Masons, participating in all of our good deeds. After having been witnessed to by my ophthalmologist for some time, I read those simple, wonderful words of Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. These words, so short and so sweet, went right through my heart. I looked in the Bible for more, and I found blessed assurance everywhere I looked. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really loved me as a real brother and he will do the same for you.